All right, Tom, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Julie, for the very uh, brief but concise introduction to the networks. And uh, now uh, I would like to, with uh, great pleasure, introduce the speakers. Uh, Dr. Ingeborg van Wucht and Dr. Liliana Melga Estrada. So Dr. Ingeborg van Wucht is a cultural historian working on the computation analysis of epistolary archives. She is currently working as a postdoc in the ERC Consolidator Project SkillNet at Utrecht University. In May 2019, she obtained her PhD cum laude from the Scala Normale Superior of Pisa in a joint degree with the University of Amsterdam. And she is an active member of the Historian Network Research and Community and co organized the Historian Network Research Conference of last June. And Dr. Liliana Melga is an information science researcher since last year. She has been working as a data specialist for the SkillNet project, supporting the scholars by processing raw data sets and applying text mining techniques to historical data. And uh, we're going to hear more exciting content from the speakers. The floor is yours. Great, thank you for this introduction just directly share my screen okay there it is uh, i hope you can all see my screen if not please uh, say so uh, so yes of course first of all i would like to we also would like to organize uh, to sorry to thank the organizers of this uh of this uh, seminar, of course, Julie, uh, Sebastian and Tanu for, of course, organizing this Digital Heritage Seminar. And we, of course, also very grateful that you are amongst the first speakers of this false historical network series. So as Tan uh, just said, my name is Ingeborg and I'm here together with Liliana uh, today to discuss some of the challenges we encountered when dealing with epistolary data collections. So just move directly to the overview of today's talk. So I will first start by saying something more about the SkillNet project and our research on the Republic of Letters. And after this description, I will move to the second part in which I will say something more about the sources we use to collect epistolary data. And one of the ways is to our crowdsourcing platform Semrel, um, and so we will take also a look into that. And I also introduce uh, a case study uh, of how I used network analysis to then uh, map to uh, to understand more about the structure of the Republic of Letters. Uh, then in the third part, Liliana will take over and she will say something more about the data preparation. So actually um, how uh, we prepare the data that is needed to do any kind of network analysis at the first place. And in this part, we really would like to stress that the preparation of, uh, of data requires the commitment from many, uh, not only at the university level, but also on a more institutional level with libraries and archives, who can actually already help us a lot with the reconciliation of person names, for instance. But Liliana is going to discuss that in more detail in the third part of this presentation. So the SkillNet project. Uh, the SkillNet project is a project from the University of Utrecht. It received funding, at least Dirk van Meert, our project leader, received funding for this project in 2018 from the European Research Council. And next year, this project is already coming to an end. Um, SkillNet, it stands for Sharing Knowledge in Learned and Literary Networks, and it conducts research into the ideal of sharing knowledge within the Republic of Letters. Um, and the Republic of Letters was a phrase used by scholars and scientists from the 16th until the 18th century, um, used to denote their own so a social world, their own scientific community. Um, and this scientific community also transcended geographical, confessional and social boundaries. Uh, so whether someone was a Catholic or Protestant, a woman or a man, a physician or a Grand Duke, that didn't really matter. It was just important that they were in contact with each other for the sake of knowledge, so to advance scholarship and the sciences. Um, so in many ways, we can actually learn some quite a few things from this ideal when we think of today's policies of open data and the open sciences, for instance. Um, so the project consists of several PhDs and postdoc projects, um, and each of us discusses a different aspect of the Republic of Letters. 
Um, this can be through text mining, for instance, as is Karen Hollemans, my colleague, is doing, and she's looking at how the, the concept of the Republic of Letters is changed over time in a large corpus of correspondence. Or we're using networks. Uh, in my case, in my research, I use network analysis to understand more about the structure of the Republic of Letters, and we will see how this, how I do this. Uh, this will be, of course, be the focus point of this presentation. Um, but before we can conduct any network analysis, uh, we need data. Um, so what is the kind of data that we are working with? And that is epistolary metadata. Um, so, and the epistolary metadata is actually basic information on a letter. Um, and this is also all the information we need to, to perform and to conduct a basic um, network analysis already. So it's not that the information that we need to, to conduct network analysis is not that complex uh, at all in this, um, for this part of the research. Um, so in this case, we have here a letter written by a sender, of course, Antonio Magliabeke in this example that you can see here. And Antonio Magliabeke wrote a letter from Florence on the 28th of September 1678, and he wrote this letter to Jacob Genovius in Amsterdam. Um, and of course, the, this information, these metadata provide the edges and the nodes or vertices, as, as Julie just uh, said. I always call them nodes, but there are different ways it mentioned, so I will just call uh, them nodes uh, in this presentation. So the sender and the recipients are, of course, the nodes of, this, uh, of these networks, and they are connected because they wrote a letter to each other. And this network can be represented over time and space because we have also the date and the sending and uh, the, the places of sending and receipts. Um, so it's Larry metadata, what are actually the sources that we use to um, to obtain these metadata? And these can be these are quite many. There are many different sources available to uh, collect epistolary metadata. This can be, of course, the manuscript letter. Uh, but many of those manuscript letters were already published uh, throughout the lifetime of these early modern scholars, so already in the 17th and 18th, but also in the 16th century. Many uh, manuscript letters were already uh, published in, uh, in editions of correspondence, and those editions were in uh, our time, so more in the last decades, were, um, were digitized by Google Books, for instance. So there's this large material uh, available, of course, in the open domain, what's ready for us to use. There are printed inventories, and also, of course, on the right part of, uh, of the screen, also online resources. This is an instance of the Epistolarium from the Huygens Institute for the History of the Netherlands. Um, and it's a very great database and tool to, uh, to collect, to look for, and also to analyze early modern uh, correspondence. Um, starting with the printed editions of early modern correspondence, so I just said uh, there's a lot, there are hundreds of thousands of editions available online in the open domain. Um, and this poses, of course, a unique uh, challenge as well, because there is this growing amount um, of material online, so we really need help in dealing with um, with um, with all this material. So this was part of our crowdsourcing platform SEMHOL. Uh, SEMHOL stands for Collecting Epistolary Metadata from the Republic of Letters. Um, and in this project, volunteers help us actually to collect metadata from the digitized printed early modern editions of correspondence. Um, and there are many challenges, of course, um, in this crowdsourcing platform, many technical challenges in uh, building up this platform and also after um, in a later stage, also processing the data and structuring the data. Uh, but in this case, the main challenge, um, I suppose, is also more social. So how do we build up a crowd? How do we maintain this crowd? And how can we also make those, um, those volunteers enthusiastic and keep working for us, basically? Um, and that's why we organize also public days and data sprints to, um, to keep up also with, uh, with the crowd. And, and so together we work in SEM where we address questions. And there are also social events, for instance, an early modern city walk to Utrecht before Corona and online data sprints and online quizzes during Corona times. Um, in November, there will be also a next data spin. So if you are interested in this, please um, be in touch with us, of course. 
Samro, this is the homepage of the project. Uh, first, the volunteers are asked to choose a language. If you want to, for, for instance, work in French, you can uh, work with French letters and you can also uh, select a certain edition that you like. And after you select an edition, an, an edition of correspondence, uh, the letter will then automatically appear on the screen and you will be presented with two tasks and the first task is to mark those letters present in these printed editions of correspondence. Um, here's an example of a volunteer that did this work. So we basically drew boxes around this the epistolary metadata that we need to conduct a network analysis. I have also here a video about how this actually works. I hope you can uh, you can see the video. So on the basis on the questions on the right part of the screen, the volunteers is asked to draw boxes around those epistolary metadata as I've defined at the beginning of my presentation. So here the information on the senders and the recipients will be captured. Uh, in the next part, the next step for the volunteers is then to transcribe that information into text, and this is done to our transcription uh, device. Um, so here we have the sender of the letter, Jacob Genovius, so the volunteer can then uh, literally type out the name of this person. And here you can see also a very crucial step in this process. So here we have Jacob Genovius. Um, and the people can actually look for this person in an external data set. I will show you the video uh, another time. Um, and this external data set is linked to our SAMRO crowdsourcing platform. And this is a data set of a union catalog of correspondence from the Oxford University. It's quite well known It's the early modern letters online. So people have actually the possibility to search for this Genovius in this early modern letter, uh, course, early modern correspondence database. Um, and if this person is present in this database, automatically a link will be um, placed and a unique identifier will be provided for this Jacob Genovius, um, which is of course essential and crucial for network analysis uh, in the first place. All those Jacob Genovius in all those editions are spelled differently. Um, and if you transform it into a network, then each of those different spelling variations of this Jacob Genovius will then also appear as different nodes in the network. So we really need to know that this Jacob Genovius is one person, he's a unique identity within this database. So he will also be a unique node in the network. Um, so collecting, um, here's an, an example of the interface then that we uh, made uh, by means of node code to represent uh, the data that these our volunteers uh, collected. Uh, so on basis of the place of sending and receipt, we made a geographical visualization um, and it's a very interactive interface so people can actually play around which is very good for our volunteers so they know exactly what the kind of work that they've been doing. Um, each node in, in this place, each city can be uh, explored. Um, there is more information on the letters, um, people can uh, find more information on the senders and uh, the recipients of the letters, for instance. Um, besides the geographical visualization, uh, we will come uh, in that in a few seconds. We have also a social visualization. Uh, so at this point, we can see how more about the structure of the, of the network made up of those printed editions of correspondence. So in blue, we have the sender and the recipients of those letters that are this, uh, recorded in those ed uh, printed editions. And the red notes are the individual letters that they send to each other. Um, and again, this is an interactive visualization, so it can be represented over time, for instance, so the notes and the edges will disappear in this visualization and so forth. So note code is a really good, great tool to have uh, very good interactive uh, visualizations of a network, for instance. Uh, so besides our crowdsourcing platform, we use also online resources, online databases of correspondence. Here you can see one of the main uh, sources we use in our project. Uh, we see on the left the Catalogus Epistolar Neerlandicarum. Uh, Diliana will say something more about this data set and all the challenges of this data set in her part of her presentation. 
Uh, we have the epistolarium, for instance, on the right, uh, on below of this uh, of this slide from the Huygens Institute. This is also a very good tool and database to search for early modern correspondence. Uh, early modern letters online in the middle of this visualization, I've already discussed it before, as it provided this external data set also as a connection with the SEMHOL platform. An Italian data set Archilite, uh, for instance. So these are some of the sources that uh, that we use. And I would like now to provide an, an example of a case study I use of network analysis and I actually to show the benefit of merging these online resources. Um, and with this example, I would like also to show you that network analysis can be a very creative uh, method. It can go beyond list of centrality measures alone, indicating, for instance, who is an important node or person in a network. Um, I would actually like to show you that network um, analysis can go beyond this and show some more about the struggles and the ambitions of persons involved in, uh, in the network. Um, and I would like to show you this with the case of Antonio Magliabecchi. He was the librarian of Grand Duke Cosimo III in Florence. And um, over time, he became one of the most consulted scholars in Europe. He, uh, and this was because of his knowledge of books. People contacted him because he knew which kind of books were published. So he was a very, I'll just take a sip of my water. So he became one of the most consulted uh, scholars in Europe. And because of that, he developed also quite an extensive network in Europe. So it was interesting, not as much why Maria Beke was a knowledge broker, because I already knew that and I also didn't really know, really, <clears throat> really needed network analysis to show that. But I was more interested in the ambitions he had and in the struggles he had in uh, in building up his network. I was just sorry. <laughs> So to do so, I uh, needed to create first his first degree network, and we can see uh, that in also in this visualization here. And based on his, his first degree network, I created based on the card catalog of the National Library of Florence. Here can, you can see also an instance of this card catalog. Um, we can see the sender, the recipient, again, the number of letters they exchanged, and also the years in which this exchange took place. So based on this card catalog, we can then create his first degree uh, network. So we can see Maria Beke in the center of this visualization and then all of his contacts around him uh, into his this first degree uh, network. Um, but to understand more about the ambitions and the struggle Maria Beke had in becoming a broker, I needed more information about his contacts. Um, like his first degree network, we don't really need network analysis. To analyze that network, we need a more context, a more context about his context. Um, so we need to provide the alters in his network. So for instance, I knew that Maria Beke from his first degree network corresponds with Cooper and Heinzius. But to understand more about the role of Maria Beke, for instance, in the Dutch Republic, I needed to have information whether Cooper and Heinzius, for instance, were in contact with each other. I needed to more know about his correspondence. So to contextualize Malia Beke's first degree network, I used uh, this data set I've mentioned before, uh, the Catalogus Epistolarum Neerlandicarum. Liliana will discuss uh, more about the details of this database. Uh, but for now, it's just important to know that this is a union catalog of correspondence present in, uh, in the Netherlands. So it's a, a library catalog um, of, li of letter collections uh, held in various institutions in the Netherlands. So it's a very rich data set uh, to work with, and it was also a very good contextualization towards this first degree network of Antonio Maria Beke. Uh, so we merged these two data sets, and then you can obtain visualizations like this. So we have in the upper part this big blob of correspondence of Maria Beke's first degree network, and then it's merged, combined with the SEN, which is in the below part of this visualization, to see the overlap between these two data sets, which then can also be represented over time. Um, so to the struggles and ambitions of Maria Beke in becoming this important knowledge broker. Um, and to understand this more, I used a framework uh, by Ronald Bird, a sociologist, 
um, and he looked at, um, at different kinds of network positions in the network. And there are two fundamental positions in the network, and those are the position of A and B. Um, and we can see here in this network that the position of A is very clustered. A is deeply embedded in his network, and it means that everyone is in contact with each other. And it means also that everyone keeps a close eye on each other. Um, so that means that there's a lot of social contract and trust in this network. Uh, so po position A is a position of trust. Um, at the same time, A is always sharing information with his mutual contacts, which means that everyone has information in common. Um, and that's uh, a disadvantage of the position of A, but that leads to our discussion to the network position of B. Uh, so B is in a quite risky position. He doesn't have any mutual contacts that are like controlling each other and that provides him a basis of trust. Uh, but the advantage of his position is that he stands between networks. So he stands between C and D, and that makes him a knowledge broker. That makes him a gatekeeper as he can control the flow of information between the networks of C and D. So two completely uh, different network positions, but the point of Ronald Bird is actually that these network positions need to be combined. The key is to combine closure with valuable bridge relations if you want to have a successful network. Um, so I was thinking, how did Mario Beki manage these two network positions in his network? So using this combined network, I used the metrics between the centrality and the clustering coefficient to understand how Malia Beki managed between these closed and struct and brokerage positions in his network. Uh, the between the centrality is used to measure the amount of brokerage in, uh, in a network. Um, it basically calculates the amount of shortest paths that go from one node to another. So if there are two nodes in the network, there's always a shortest path that go to those nodes and the between and centrality calculates the, um, the number of shortest paths. Um, closure can be, um, can be uh, analyzed based on the idea of triadic closure. Uh, triadic closure is the idea that if Maya Beki, for instance, corresponds with A and B, then it's very likely that A and B also will be in contact at some point in the future, because it's very likely that Maya Beki will introduce them to each other. Um, and try the closure, this idea can be measured by the clustering coefficients, um, which basically um, calculates the, the abundance of these closed triads in the network. If you want to know more about these uh, metrics, you can of course also ask it at the end of this presentation. Uh, so, Maria Beke, um, if we measure the between a centrality and a clustering coefficient in this combined first degree network with the catalogus Epistolarum Neerlandicarum, we obtain visualizations uh, like this. So, this is basically a network, only it's visualized a bit differently. Um, so, we start, we can see in the beginning of, uh, of his career actually that he starts with a very high clustering coefficient. So, there's a lot of trust involved in his network and he really needed this trust at the beginning of his career. After that, he could move outside his network to search for brokers opportunities to obtain new books and new information so that he gradually became an important information broker in the Netherlands, uh, in, uh, the Netherlands in Europe, also between Dutch Republic and, uh, and Italy. Um, but the main thing of this visualization is that you can really direct our attention to certain periods in his career, to certain letters, for instance. So this kind of visualization has a kind of distant reading that redirects our attention to particular periods in his life. Why did he lost uh, at some point his brokerage position, for instance? And I would like to show you this briefly uh, with an example. In uh, 1684, Maria Bay. <coughs> Mario Beke became um, involved with the Inquisition. Uh, they accused him for writing a, a book that um, became uh, later listed on the Index for Prohibited Books. Uh, only Mario Beke did not write uh, this book, but still he became in, uh, involved in, with the Inquisition and he had a lot of problems uh, with that. Uh, so here we see really that his brokerage position drops. Uh, brokerage. Um, Brokerage position is a time consuming activity. So we can really see that he was really preoccupied with the Inquisition. He didn't have the time to nurture his relationships. So here we can see that something really happened in his, uh, in his career. 
Uh, on the other side, we can also see that his closure uh, uh, increases, so the other uh, the other way around. And then we can really read, I'll we'll just get uh, water, I have really dry throat today. So we can really see here that the closure in his network increases, which means that there's something happens that his really that his network around him uh, became densely uh, connected. Um, so I went back to the letters and to read what actually happened here. And here we can see also a letter from Malia Beke to Cooper, in which he says that there are a lot of people actually wrote letters to protect him, to um, to write. Uh, against him in his defense. So they really didn't agree with the Inquisition. So they start writing letters to him in his defense. So like the whole close network around him um, acted together to help to prove his innocence. So at this point, we see that really distrust and this social control and also help um, against Malia Beke's enemies became activated in this network. So this is really a way of uh, of combining network analysis also with archival research and the close reading of uh, of the letters. Uh, but before we can do that, before we can make these kinds of analysis, we need still to structure the data. And that's why I would like to move on to the third part of the presentation in which Liliana will say something more about the data preparation. And I will stop sharing my screen yes so yes i think we're still seeing ms teams lila oh, okay great i you on mute Hello. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, so, in this part of the presentation, I will discuss briefly the challenges of um, converting this catalog metadata into a, da uh, a data set that is ready for Ingeborg and other researchers in the future to do network analysis. Um, in this slide, you see some of the most important historical collections of uh, letter metadata worldwide. So luckily, there, ha there have been efforts into uh, digitizing these letters and making them available. And you see the SEN is one of the, let's say, the ones, the, one, the collections that more uh, has more letters uh, metadata available. Then there is also the Emblo collection that Ingeborg already mentioned, Corresp Search, Calliope, Epistolarium. Uh, so some of these uh, collections provide access to the letters only, the letters metadata. Others combine letters with other types of documents, for instance, photo collections like Calliope, and others provide access to uh, only the metadata or to the content of the letters in some cases, in some fortunate cases like Epistolarium or Emblu. Uh, so from this from the numbers, it is obvious that the, the SEN is one of the most important uh, epistolary collections. It is a national uh, catalog, as uh, already Ingeborg mentioned. It is a union catalog, an aggregated um, union catalog of different uh, archives and institutions in the Netherlands, uh, mostly the university libraries of Amsterdam, uh, Leiden, Groningen, Utrecht, and the National Library of the Netherlands, the KB. Uh, in total, it contains approximately 500,085 uh, descriptions of uh, letters and parts of correspondences uh, written from the um, uh, uh, 1500s to the present. And uh, so uh, these letters, um, are, uh, these uh, descriptions are not the same as the individual letters, but I will discuss that in a moment. Uh, the SEN is available via um, um, Picarta, which was a sort of a portal to uh, collections in the Netherlands, available to Dutch universities only. But now, uh, since this year, uh, this collection, uh, this metadata is open via WorldCat. 
uh, by OCLC. So you can all access this metadata. Um, here in this uh, graphic, we see uh, that there are around 60,000 records uh, that correspond to the period of interest to the researchers uh, of the SkillNet project, so 1500 to the Napoleonic period, more or less. Here uh, you see an approximate indication of the number of letters in this period, but the exact number cannot be known. Um, and this is because um, in the Seine, uh, um, the records describe sometimes a single letter or sometimes they describe a group of letters. So in this slide, you see screenshots from the open refine tool that is used in the cleaning process. Uh, the block on the left shows the original data. So you see that there are uh, more or less 568 uh, um, ways of describing these um, amounts of uh, letters. Um, and there are some cases in, it in which is written one letter, but there are also for, there is also, for instance, one record that says one box uh, or others that says 127 boxes. So it is impossible to know how many uh, letters are in those boxes. Um, and there are thousands of records like this uh, and that don't have a, a year even. So there is also missing data, which makes it impossible to know how many letters are in the same. Uh, but after uh, doing some cleaning, we can say that there are more or less 50,000 individual letters and 14,000 descriptions of um, collective uh, aggregates of letters. Um, so why, uh, why the SEN is important for research? Uh, not only because of this huge amount of letters, but also because uh, this uh, metadata has been collected in a decentralized way. So it has not been focused on individuals, as it's often the case when, when uh, scholars make these uh, editions of letters, printed editions, they focus on, on one person's correspondence. But in this case, it's decentralized. There are many individuals uh, who have written letters that have been collected by these archives. So that this makes it very interesting for uh, researching it, uh, researching a network. Um, it has never been studied as a corpus, the Zen, um, and, and it has been assembled during many years, since the 70s, uh, 80s, more or less. So this makes it, this collection very interesting. However, it is messy. It is very messy. Many hands have entered data over the years. Uh, different standards have been followed. Um, uh, and it's, not a, it's, it's data that was not made with the purpose of uh, facilitating research, but of facilitating access. So when, when catalogers describe collections, the purpose is to, to uh, enable findability, but it doesn't mean that everything is standardized in a way that can be uh, ready to be used for research. Uh, so the challenge was that, but even though uh, it was so challenging, uh, Ingeborg uh, first and then the SkillNet project uh, as a whole decided we are going to clean this data set and make it ready for researchers. Um, so the data from the SEN is not available to download. Um, all of it or parts of it is, is not possible. Only this year, as I mentioned, is, it was made accessible openly by a WorldCat. Um, so Ingeborg personally made contact with the National Library of the Netherlands and, and OCLC, and they provided a data dump, uh, which was a raw XML file uh, row XML file. Yes, with no filters, all the data was given. And then uh, it was more or less 500,000 uh, records, as we mentioned. And uh, this was processed um, uh, with some help uh, to convert it to a CSV file that was ready to be cleaned. Uh, there have been uh, two rounds of cleaning. The first one was done by Ingeborg herself as part of her PhD project. Um, it took a lot of time and effort from her research time. <laughs> and then the second round, we started it last year uh, when I was hired uh, for the SkillNet project in March, and we together started, started to, uh, to clean this, uh, let's say, in a, in a very systematic way to make it ready 
to, to as a deliverable of the SkillNet project. Uh, next year we will give it to researchers and in the meantime uh, Ingeborg also can do some, some research with it. Um, now, uh, what, what we say is very challenging, but what are the challenges? Uh, it's, it's mostly that the data that is needed for network analysis, which is the person's names and the dates and the places, is really uh, inconsistent. So, um, uh, there are also there is also the problem of missing data. At least seven per seven percent of the letters miss a, a date or a year, and um, also the person names don't have, let's say, dates of birth or death, which makes it very hard to, um, uh, let's say, assign a, or infer a date of uh, for these letters. There are also mixed data types, so uh, catalogers use a lot of uncertainty marks. Uh, in the data itself, uh, so dates have question marks or circa or tusen or uh, all sorts of marks, um, personal notes included, uh, so the data types are not clearly separated. Um, so uh, then the, the work of the data uh, processing uh, becomes really um, challenging. Uh, and it consists, and that's my work, uh, to, to make this data consistent, accurate and reliable for answering research questions, but at the same time to keep the, the transparency of the process so that the researchers can be, can be accountant for what has been done to this data. So I have to, for instance, every time that uh, something is inferred, to keep uh, um, a column that says this was inferred. or. Um, uh, keep always the original data in a way that you can trace back all the changes that you did. Uh, I will show some examples of uh, how uh, the data was and how it has been cleaned and uh, briefly say some solutions I have applied for this. Uh, so for instance, the date fields, um, you see uh, again uh, screenshots from OpenRefine on the left side or maybe your right side, the original um, date field contained 15,000 uh, values for the dates. So uh, that shows all uh, catalogers use so many ways uh, to describe this. So in some cases, uh, dates, days and months were added. In some cases, they were twos and this and that. Um, yeah, uncertainty marks, all possible ways to enter. Sometimes the day is first and then the month. Sometimes the year is first, vice versa. So after cleaning this, we see more or less um, 300 uh, options for year. So from 15,000, we went to 300 uh, for year. And also the datiering, which is more or less like, let's say, the month and day in which letter was written, also had more than 6,000 choices or values, and it became 500. Um, so um, this is more or less an example of how the dates have been cleaned. And then this, ha having the years cleaned, uh, this allows, um, yeah, uh, this makes it possible to observe some changes over time or to cluster um, um, persons per uh, or letters per uh, decades or so. But it also makes it possible to um, do data imputation. So then uh, we can, um, then assign dates of, uh, to the persons who wrote these letters. Uh, we know then the person was active in the year that the letter was written, and then we can then use those uh, inf inferences to, to uh, yeah, create some rules to then later map persons and, and, and make more cl uh, clustering a bit more uh, rigorous. So then I go to the person's case, so the, the names of the persons in, in, um, in the SEN uh, and in any letter collection, the ideal is that you, you would have a single name for a single person or a single identifier for a single person. But this is not the case. Um, and in the case of SEN, and in any, any letter collection, you have a column for sender and a column for receiver. If there are no unique identifiers for persons, then uh, catalogers or any person entering the data 
we might make inconsistencies entering the name of the sender in, in one form and when the same sender received a letter this name was entered in another form but they are the same person so uh, the first thing i uh, one um, one has to deal with is uh, inconsistency but also that um, there are um, yeah for instance the case of christian Huygens, it was spelled in more or less 300 different ways in the case of the epistolarian project they find found out and we also have homonyms, so uh, Christian Huygens, there are three at least in, in uh, the, yeah, there, there were at least three, and uh, there are uh, the Constantines, and there are many homonyms uh, also, so it's, it's really good luck when one finds uh, the dates of birth and death added to the persons, but this is not always the case. And yeah, there are the, the same catalog doesn't use unique identifiers for persons in all cases. In some cases they do, uh, but because this was a union catalog, and um, they, uh, they not always share these identifiers. So you have um, some libraries use them very consistently and almost every record has them, but some other libraries didn't use them. So once you aggregate these things, you get all this uh, inconsistency. Mm, in some cases, they used uh, IS and I numbers uh, for persons, but not in all cases. So the first task of the data cleaner was to combine all these names uh, into a sort of authority list. So not sender, receiver, but just names, and then of course keep the role uh, if it was sender or receiver, then parse any other information that was not the name string, for instance, the date of birth, the date of death, also if there were name variants, sometimes added in parentheses or so. Uh, then add, uh, do some data imputation, as I mentioned, based on the letter year, we could say a person was active in this year and then use these years for mappings. And then cluster variants, that was the, that is still ongoing. <laughs> uh, we, I use a string matching a script for this, a library from, from Python called uh, FOSIVOC for this um, string matching. And, and then I use the dates uh, to add rules uh, to these mappings. Uh, it's still, even though the process is done semi-automatically, a lot of manual work is involved. Uh, then we also remove duplicates. We do reconciliation um, to external uh, databases, knowledge bases uh, of the source of person names. For instance, to CERN, we are constantly uh, uh, referring to CERN to, uh, to do mappings and uh, getting identifiers and so. And later we will harmonize, uh, reconcile it to the Biographies Portal, which is a database of person names in, in the Netherlands, and to Wikidata. And we hope to add the new names that we get from this uh, process to add it to Wikidata later, if possible, because sometimes Wikidata doesn't allow to add historical names <laughs> that are maybe only the, of which we only know maybe the name and there is no more information. Mm, we provide at the moment unique identifiers uh, in the skill uh, net domain um, but uh, when we will also provide all these other identifiers once we have done the mappings to the external sources. Mm, the tools that we use in this process are open refine and uh, Python scripts, uh, basic ones to uh, to be able to add rules. Because even though OpenRefine is very powerful for cleaning messy data, uh, and its clustering algorithms are very good, uh, um, they you cannot apply uh, rules there. It's all only string based. So if you want to cluster, for instance, the Franciscus Burmanus, and you find these options in your data, you cannot cluster the two last ones because you know there is a typo there in the date of death. And uh, then you cannot, you also cannot compare if it is the same as the first one. So it's better to do this based on, on rules. And uh, I provide a list of mapping candidates to Ingeborg, or I do it myself. And then when we decide uh, which are the correct mappings, then we integrate them into the into the data. 
Uh, the, the tools then have been, uh, yeah, Excel we didn't use uh, in the second round of cleaning uh, because uh, it was quite limited for the task and uh, the data became too big and complex also for reconciliation and so it's not uh, suitable. Uh, Open Refine is quite good for certain uh, tasks, um, but Python and Jupyter Notebooks are a lot more flexible and powerful. Um, but we integrate uh, mostly OpenRefine and Python in the process. Uh, but not even the most sophisticated tools can help with this historical data. It is really challenging to, um, to cluster the mappings when you have uh, all these variants. When there is so much uh, domain knowledge needed, for instance, in the case of Daniel Heinzius, if you don't know that he was also called Theocritus Agranda, then you will miss this clustering on the left. Also, there are uh, uh, persons who had the same name, but um, they, they were different persons. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as in the case of Adrianus Blyenburg, you see there are at least uh, six of them. <laughs> um, so, but we have progressed a lot. The data set is quite um, quite clean. Uh, and at this moment, we are focused on um, on the Maglia uh, network um, to uh, in increase the amount of data available for the research that Ingeborg is doing. So the next step include to clean, uh, finalize the cleaning of this uh, data set. Data set. Um, and then um, we will reconcile it to the external uh, sources and make it available uh, next year as a deliverable of the SkillNet project. So this was a short um, summary of uh, the data preparation process that we do uh, of this catalog metadata to make it available for research, uh, network research. And now I will just uh, give some conclusions and uh, uh, future work. So the challenges uh, of using this catalog metadata is that uh, first of all, access uh, is difficult for researchers. So uh, even though you find catalogs like MLO, for instance, uh, the data is not ready to be downloaded or used for research. Uh, so access is still difficult. Um, and then um, this metadata originates from different sources. So when a researcher manages to get the data from one and another catalog, these uh, catalogs are so diverse that it's very hard to merge them. And uh, also because there are no common identifiers for letters, uh, not something like an ISBN equivalent for books. Uh, it, is, it doesn't exist for letters. Uh, the, the duplication process is a very cumbersome task. And uh, there are no standards for cataloging letter metadata that are widely used, or there are some, but it's not, um, it, it, they don't give the level of detail that is needed to deal with, uh, for instance, uncertainty or um, providing identifiers or so. So it is very, um, in abstract in a way. There are some templates out there from MLO, Epistolarium also has a template and uh, Coresp Search has also created an exchange format, but they usually don't give the, the sort of specific guidelines that uh, uh, catalogers or researchers need to, uh, to, to follow to have this data um, very standardized to exchange. Uh, identifiers for person names are used only occasionally and unfortunately, uh, luckily not very consistently. And identifiers for place names are hard, hardly used. And um, so um, uh, before using catalog metadata, a lot of time has to be invested in the data preparation. Uh, if catalogers are attending this presentation, then you can help uh, researchers by using common identifiers for persons, uh, separate all marks of uncertainty uh, from the data, uh, or yeah, providing clear separators <laughs> that can be consistently used using public vocabularies for places and uh, try to make this data more easily accessible. Mm. 
And then researchers can do better also by um, keeping trace of their, the steps they do when they clean this data. So now Ingeborg will say something about the network, uh, historical network research community, and then we uh, come out to an end to this presentation. Yes, I will be very uh, brief, so there will be much time for uh, for questions. Uh, so as I uh, said before, I play an active role in the historical network research community. So if you are interested in network analysis uh, in history, for instance, there is the website with a lot of resources you can use to uh, to know more about how other people dealt with uh, networks, for instance, in their research. There's a bibliography of almost at least uh, all articles using networks to explore uh, questions, of course, about the past. I would also like to mention that this Thursday we have or organized also a lunch lecture by Cindera Lapetz. I think it will be very interesting and she's showing more about network analysis and mostly court uh, reports from the 19th century uh, as well. So I think that's a very good starting point also if you want to maybe uh, conduct a network analysis in your research. So this is a very good starting point. And of course, each year we organize also a conference, uh, which is also also very well attended. And we have also a journal in case you want your research uh, published. Um, Always, of course, you can always uh, keep in touch with us if you are interested in our activities or just take a look at our website. And hopefully I will also see some of you uh, at the lunch lecture on uh, on Thursday. Um, and that's it from our part, I think. There can now be uh, time for questions, so I will redirect uh, to, uh, to Tan again. Thank you very much for the very, very nice talk. And uh, at this moment, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I suggest that um, uh, for the participants, if you are interested in uh, asking questions, you can just turn on your microphone and your uh, uh, camera and uh, uh, ask the questions to the uh, speakers.